While results from yesterday's midterms are still rolling in, it's already clear that the expected red wave was more like a little red splishy splash. <laughs> According to pollster John De La Volpe, voters under 30 might be the reason. While voters over the age of 45 favored the GOP by double digits, the 18 to 29 voter block favored Democrats by 28 points. Joining us now to weigh in on this is CEO and founding partner of Hit Strategies, Terrence Woodbury, and Newsweek contributor and business consultant, Denise Long. Welcome to you both. Good morning. All right, Terrence, this may not be super surprising, at least the fact that uh, younger voters tend to skew pretty overwhelmingly Democrat. But is there a unexpected turnout story here? And if so, to what do you attribute that? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, th their support of Democrats is not surprising, but their turnout in this midterm has defied some, some, some precedent here. You know, we have been expecting that likely voter polls were underrepresenting Democratic performance because likely voters polls did not include the 24 million new voters that we new Democratic voters that we activated in 2018. And so the question here has always been, uh, will we be able to turn out that 2018 anti-Trump, anti-MAGA surge without putting Trump on the ballot and young people increase their share from 2018 to now by 2% and people of color increase their share by 1%. And so a, an electorate that is younger and more diverse than 2018 is an electorate that favors Democrats. Hmm. Yeah, uh, Denise, I wonder if we're seeing, we're, we're just going to see kind of permanently high turnout in general. Um, you know, perhaps the message that the most important election of our lifetime, yada, yada, yada. You know, I tend to roll my eyes at that a little bit because that's what they always say. But maybe it's sunk mm -hmm. in and now young voters um, who historically had to be really motivated to get to the polls or, you know, have something really to believe. Maybe they're just going to show up um, in record numbers just like the rest of us because it, it's sunk in for everyone that this really matters. Well, I think in, in many ways, this election, as others uh, immediately before it, demonstrates the ways that Republicans haven't actually made a solid case for their stance on the culture war. I think there are ways that with the younger generation particularly, um, it's been ingrained that the right to an abortion is uh, a human right, a constitutional, nationally protected right, um, is a human right and that somehow this decision um, took away that right. I think there are ways that uh, my Republican party talks about issues of race uh, racism and black people in America in particular that um, alienates the younger generation when they've been steeped in, uh, certainly when you talk about folks who are in college, steeped in this idea that, uh, you know, uh, if any of us are left behind, all of us are left behind. So there are ways that my party needs to really up its game and up its ante when it comes mm -hmm. to delivering on the culture and what they're going to do about the culture in the United States. Yeah, I think the ab abortion uh, point is a really good one, Denise. This is from an October teen Vogue national poll. Six out of 10 young voters surveyed plan to cast a ballot for a candidate who supports abortion rights. Majorities of Americans from 18 to 65 support the right to abortion, but 74% of people under 35, the highest percentage in the survey, do support that right. And we definitely saw that last night. Yeah, it, it certainly seems that way. Yes. You, you know, but Denise, I, I would I would argue that Republicans have made their position on the culture war crystal clear. They have made it very clear uh, through through their ads and their rhetoric and their embrace of white supremacy, their position on race and justice, their position on on women's access and, and, and uh, access to abortion. And what is what's important about young people, young voters, they millennials and Gen Z have emerged as the biggest voting bloc in America. But they're also the most diverse voting bloc in America. They lead with their identities. And as long as Republicans take these positions on identity politics, on things like abortion and race and, and crime and policing and voting rights and immigration, then they are alienating the growing marketplace of young voters and Democrats have an opportunity to really uh, achieve a political realignment by bringing... Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I would all. say That's, that Republicans ahead, haven't Denise. made a yeah. good. Yeah, sorry, I would say that Republicans haven't made a good enough presentation on the cost 
to a current Americans, whether you're a multi-generational white Americans, part of the white settler colonial class, or you're part of the 40 million of us who are descendants of U.S. slaves, they haven't made a good enough case on recognizing the ways that immigration, for example, that you mentioned, actually does have negative costs. And we've known this for generations from Barack Obama's civil rights uh, data uh, and on and on and on. So Republicans haven't made a good enough case. They haven't come forth offering the clarity that that we need as a party to help Americans see. The other piece is the way that people with the decision from um, the justices about abortion, the way it was catastrophized in the sense that people can't get abortions. And there needs to be some balance, truly, to your point about what that decision looks like in real life. Uh, when we say that there isn't a constitutional, national constitutional right to an abortion in the way that we generally knew it, what does it mean in practice? And how do we address those issues rather they catastrophize it and make it more than it is. Well, last night in Florida, the first Gen Z member of Congress was elected. 25-year-old Maxwell Frost will fill the seat vacated by Congresswoman Val Demings, who challenged Senator Marco Rubio for his seat. Frost campaigned on a number of policies, including what he called reimagining justice through ending mass incarceration, demilitarizing the police, and abolishing the death penalty. I mean, some of that you know, that's going to be popular among young people, but I, I mean, uh, you know, abolishing the police, et cetera. Um, it won in Florida. Not, what do you mean it won in Florida? I mean, this guy won the seat. He won Val Deming's old seat. And it's worth a noting. A Democratic seat, yeah. Right. And, it, and it's a couple of other, it's worth noting a couple of other races that we haven't yet covered here today. Um, uh, there was a. Uh, uh, a, 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 a person who was known as a hardliner, uh, a sheriff in Massachusetts, who lost his seat. There was a um, Minnesota in Minnesota, which has been the, the root of so much of the conflict post George Floyd. Um, pro criminal justice reform candidates uh, won. Keith Ellison was able to hold on to his seat. So the, the, the Democrats have really been, I think, afraid of their shadow with respect to a lot of the fallout from the George Floyd protests. And Terry uh, I, I wonder what you make of this, because I think that a lot of the good advice, the reasonable advice that people were taking was to avoid those t subjects, talk more about funding the police. Stacey Abrams certainly took that advice and talked about how she wanted to increase police pay. It didn't seem to have paid off for her. What do you think about the Democrats I mean, but, and whether or not they should follow the but lead of the young? Just to add to what you say, though, it was a mixed bag for criminal justice reform. You know, Ohio and Alabama both, pa both passed uh, bail initiatives that will make it um, harder to get bail for people. So there were, there were some wins and some losses, I think, in the criminal justice category. But go, go ahead. Absolutely. So we do believe that Democrats should take a more aggressive uh, and progressive position on policing, that there is, a, there is a path to winning the majority here. And more importantly, there's a path to mobilizing the base. There's these young voters who we've already acknowledged are the, are the growing marketplace, but also are the most le least likely voters. These were the same voters that showed up in the summer of 2020, that protested in every battleground state in every city, and they demanded, they, they demanded reform. But what's important is the progress that has been made, because these are also the same voters that don't believe our promises. They are more cynical towards the promises of politicians, but they will believe the progress that, that Merrick Garland's Justice Department has banned no-knock warrants, banned chokeholds, and ended the federal government's relationship with private prisons that he has prosecuted Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Arbery's murderers with federal hate crime uh, 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 indictments. And so there's progress being made, but, the, but I do agree that Democrats have to be, become more clear about their progressive stance and that what they are suggesting is not defunding the police, but in fact funding the uh, services that prevent crimes of desperation as opposed to just uh, responding to them after they happen. Well, Denise, we'll give you the last word. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I don't, I don't know that we win when we make it harder for people to get out of jail. I think there's balance. And I think the American people continue to lose when we have this polarizing rhetoric from the left 
and the right. The reality is that immigration does need to be addressed in this nation. While it does feel good to some to have loose or open borders, it does cost the American people in terms of political representation, employment. And there's even data that it shows for black men in particular who don't have a high school d- uh, diploma that it costs them in terms of incarceration. Um, what we need is reasoned policies. And I would suggest that the Republicans who claim to be the adults in the room <laughs> need to actually step up and be able to do what Terrence is talking about, what I've been talking about, is really name the realities of the ways that race and racism have an impact on lived experience in the United States of America. They need to reinvigorate their relationship with the descendants of slaves, the American freedmen of this country, so that the left can stop bastardizing our legacy to do things that ultimately undermine us as well as the American people. And until we get to that point of reasoned dialogue and reasoned policies, we're going to continue to lose and pick the lesser of two evils. Terrence and Denise, thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Thank you for having me. Thank you. More Rising right after this. <laughs>